I'm Joe Feek, editor of Poultry Health Today, and with me is Dr. John Glisson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Georgia. John, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Now, please take this the right way, but you've been in the industry for quite some time. You've seen time. a lot of changes. But one of the constants that we seem to see is respiratory disease. Why is that? Well, you know, respiratory diseases, uh, the ones that we deal with so often, are just highly contagious. They're easy to spread compared to some other diseases. And, and that's a big part of it. It's just the ease of spread. We, we never seem to be able to completely get rid of them. Now, when I talked to you about doing this interview, uh, we talked about respiratory disease, and you said that IB and ILT were the, the two biggies. Yeah. Uh, let's talk in particular about uh, ILT. Why is that a biggie? ILT is, is uh, a disease that's very similar to a uh, number of diseases we see in other animals. Uh, it's a herpes virus. It's caused by a herpes virus. And once a bird is infected with a herpes virus, it's infected forever. And so once you have it in a flock, uh, uh, those birds can shed that virus for the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. you know, as long as, even though they're healthy. Yeah. So the, the, the reservoir of, of available virus is out there all the time from birds that have recovered. So we never actually completely get rid of it, is, is I guess the short reason. But the thing about ILT is that it seems to, to come and go. I mean, unlike infectious bronchitis, it's a fact of life, it's out there every year. There are, are some years when ILT is really, really bad, and then other years not so. How come? Yeah. Well, we have it every year. We don't. We never have a year without it completely. Right. So it's all relative, and it really depends on what type of uh, growing system it gets into, and what kind of opportunity it has to spread. The virus itself is fairly sensitive to heat, and has much more difficult time spreading in the summertime here in the south when it's 100 degrees. 100 degrees Fahrenheit will kill the virus. So, uh, but it it can survive very well in cold weather. And because of that, once it gets into a dense growing system, you know, like a broiler complex in the wintertime, the virus persists, persists, and persists, and then has the ability to spread. And when does it tend to strike? We tend to see it uh, very seldom before do we ever see it before two weeks of age? Usually in broilers it's going to be three, four, five weeks of age. But here's another little piece of the puzzle with ILT that's different than infectious bronchitis. You know, with infectious bronchitis, the birds get infected, they get sick immediately, and they're shedding the virus. It's easy. ILT is different, and it's when they get infected with the virus, they shed it for two or three days before they come sick, become sick. So you don't know they have it. So people like me going into chicken houses or servicemen or whatever, we go in and we see the flock and it looks normal. Actually, they, they may already have the virus. They're shedding it and they're going to be sick in two or three days. And that's oh. another reason that the virus is so easy to spread. In the, in the beginning stages when the birds are shedding the virus, it's silent. You don't see it. It makes biosecurity very important. I was just going to say, but if you don't know it's there, I mean, biosecurity needs to be a day-to-day -day yes. practice, but are, are there some uh, other things that producers can do to provide additional protection against ILT? Biosecurity is the number one thing. And of course, in, in breeders and layers, birds are going to live for a long time. They're routinely vaccinated. So uh, we don't want to have to routinely vaccinate broilers. But in the event of an outbreak, we vaccinate the broiler to try to give them some protection. But it's not easy to do. Uh, none of the vaccines are perfect. Right, right. Now, um, I know that the, uh, a lot of producers like to use the vectored vaccines. Yes. They're uh, safe, easy to use, and so forth. Um, I've, I've read some reports, though, that sometimes the vectored vaccines don't prevent against reinfection. Has that been the case with ILT? Well, with, with the vector vaccines, uh, the, the ones that we have available for ILT are also vectored into a herpes virus. Mm -hmm. And I would say the number one problem with the vaccine is the immune response is slow. Yeah. So we vaccinate those birds in ovo in the hatchery, right. and it takes a few weeks for them to become fully immune. And in many cases, they get challenged before they get fully immune. And the other thing that the vector vaccines do not do is they don't prevent the shed of the virus once right. the birds get infected. So they don't help a lot in controlling the spread of the virus. The beautiful thing about them is they don't cause any disease themselves. They're right. very, very safe. Yeah. So 
no we start talking about vaccines, it's like everything in life. There's pluses and minuses, mm -hmm. and, and you weigh it. So the vector vaccines are used in certain situations, and other situations they're not used. So what have we learned about vaccinating for ILT? What, what's the most uh, effective way to, to get that done? To provide the solid, solid protection, still the old-timey, what we call chicken embryo origin vaccine, mm -hmm. provides the best protection. There's nothing really that compares to it in providing protection. It also, if not handled properly, causes the most side effects. So for a company that can vaccinate with a chicken embryo origin vaccine and do it well and, and pay attention to detail, they, they, they're very successful with it. So other companies that, that don't do it so well and maybe get sloppy in the application, they cause a lot of problems. So again, it's, there's some pluses and minuses to everything out there. Now, what about diagnostics? I mean, we just rely on visual symptoms for ILT, or there are some tests that producers could do ahead of time to get clued in on this disease a little sooner? Most veterinarians can diagnose ILT with their eyes and their hands. It has particular uh, lesions that are very characteristic, but, but then that, that is confirmed by taking sections of the trachea, uh, sending it in for histopathology, where it's looked at microscopically, and, and the virus grows in big clumps inside the tracheal cells that we call inclusion bodies. It's very characteristic. So the standard thing is for the veterinarian to look at, okay, I think this looks like ILT, take the samples for histopathology. Pathologist says, yes, you got herpes virus inclusions in the cells, and that's ILT. So we don't normally need a lot of what we would call advanced or fancy diagnostics. It's uh, the old-fashioned way works very, very well. Now, there are some other things. We can use PCR and do all sorts of things, but in most cases, it's not necessary for a trained person to do that. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the next frontier. I know research has been a big part of your career. Uh, are you, you or any of your colleagues uh, doing something to try to get a better understanding of ILT and oh, ILT yes. management? In my current position as Vice President of Research at U.S. Poultry, we, we fund uh, research projects all over the country and we have two essentially two different areas that we're funding in ILT and vaccine development at two different universities using two totally different approaches and those projects have been going on for a couple years now so we're very helpful that uh, through this funding process that we have that we're going to be able to generate the next generation of vaccines that will be hopefully safer and more efficacious. We'll look forward to hearing about them. Yeah, I look forward to it too. <laughs> Excellent. We've been talking with Dr. John Glisson, Professor Emeritus from the University of Georgia. John, thanks again for sitting in. Thank you. You bet.